Richard. Uh, I've been homebrewing for 13 odd years. Uh, I've been judging beer for quite a long time as well. I'm a certified judge and I'm involved in running the Manchester Homebrew Group. If you want to see more of me talking, I'm also Tertiary Brewery on YouTube. That's it for me. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Okay, let me just cut back over. Yeah, there should be sound now. Uh, can someone tell me if they can hear us or not? Oh, can't hear you. No sound. One second. Sounds working now, it seems. Just, yeah, I'm definitely getting sound. Uh, oh, that's better. Yeah, sound's working now. Cool. One of those little YouTube yeah. quirks, obviously. Well, we're working now. That's the main thing. Right, um, so, yeah. Rich is with me tonight. We're going to be talking about judging beer. First off, I want to just let you know what I intend for this series of chats in the evenings and let you know where we're going. I was supposed to be doing an introduction to beer judging for some uh, beer judges who wanted to go through the exams. Unfortunately, it all got cancelled because of COVID. So the next best thing we can do is do it as a live stream, do it online, and we'll give you a beer judge exam cor prep course light. So we'll do all the details of judging beer, sampling beer, different styles, just as we would with new beer judges. We just won't go into too much detail about all the BJCP, all the different ranks and how you rank up and all that sort of thing, which is what you'll need to sit the online entrance exam. If there's a demand for that, we can do that at another time or in another way and maybe cover that as well. But over the next few weeks, we're going to try several different beers from totally different styles, help you discover different beer styles, build up your palate and your skills at analysing the different elements of the beer. For some of you who are in the chat, this will be revision. There are some experienced beer judges there. There's some people who are training to be beer judges. And there's a lot of people who just like beer. And welcome to all of you. Uh, Richard's done introduction courses for want to be beer judges before, so he's got a lot to add in as we go through. And this isn't just going to be me talking all night. Uh, but I do just want to start off by going through what the... BJCP style guide is and what it isn't. If you look down there, you'll find a link. It should be underneath this video where you can go and see the BJCP style guide, a BJCP store score sheet, and there should be a link to Rich's YouTube channel there as well. So what is the BJCP style guide? Well, first off, here's an example of one of the styles. This is what we're going to be drinking tonight. This is Duval. We're going to judge it as the 25C Belgian Golden Strong Ale. But basically, I hear all sorts of arguments about the style guide dictates what you can brew. But that is, that is so far from the truth. The beer style guide is just a framework for judging beer. If you enter a beer into a competition which uses the BJCP style guide, then this is what your beer will be judged against. That's all there is to it. It doesn't dictate what you have to brew. You can brew what you want to brew, when you want to brew. But just be aware, if you enter it into a competition using a style guide, and it's not just the BJCP one, there's other ones, then that's when it matters if your beer is brewed to style or not. So any thoughts on the style guide, Rich, before we move swiftly on? I think there's a point about if you're entering your beers in your competitions, taste, taste them and see what style to enter them in, because you may not, they may not be what you targeted by the time you finish brewing them. Yeah, very much so. I think that's a very valid point because so often people enter a beer into a competition and they haven't actually looked at what it is that the beer is supposed to be like. And when they do that, then suddenly it becomes problematic because it doesn't match the style. Cool. All right. On to some tips for sampling beer. 
and that's what we're going to be doing right after these tips so i'm sure richard's got a lot i'll start you off with one and that is when you some when you go for the aroma of a beer what you'll see a lot of people do is shove their nose right down inside the glass take a huge storming whiff and blow out all their receptors so they can't smell anything for the next five minutes you're much better off either doing a flyby just taking a few gentle whiffs of it or wafting it towards you personally i much prefer the flyby it looks a lot less pretentious than the than the whiffing so that's my first tip for you with regard to sampling beer rich so staying staying on aroma if you do start to feel your your senses go dulling as you smell the lot of beer try to smell something that's not beer often a bit of your clothing is quite good like your sleeve or something like that that has no beer like aromas on it and that will often get your senses back again yeah definitely that's another good one um moving on to flavor from me a lot of times if you've just got a beer out the fridge so for instance i've got something here that's fresh out the fridge it's very cold when beer is very cold you don't get a lot of the flavor and aroma from it you're normally better off just letting the beer warm up a bit first you don't want to go all the way to room temperature because i'll be perfectly honest I know there's a lot of cask aficionados who will disagree with me, but I personally don't find room temperature beer that appealing. So I tend to go for, this has been in my beer fridge, it's at 11 to 12 degrees C, what we commonly refer to in the UK as cellar temperature. Uh, that could be much lower when you say cellar temperature in another country like the US. But over here, 11 to 13 C is kind of the happy midpoint for me anyway. You get plenty of aroma, plenty of flavor, but it's not warm water sort of thing going on. Anything you'd like to add, Rich? To slightly spin off that one again, you can, it's much easier to warm beer up than cool it down. So if it's a little bit cold, You've got it in a glass. You can always hold it like this or something and just use your, your hands to warm it up. Um, so if it's a little bit cold, that's fine. But if it's warm and they're a bit, bit too warm, it's much harder to cool it down again. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Um, all right, where are we? OK. Uh, the other thing you can try doing, um, when you're trying to get the aroma from beer, sometimes it's better to take a mouthful of the beer swallow it and breathe in and then breathe out through your nose and you can get some quite different aromas and sensations from the beer doing that where you're doing it retro nasally than you would if you're breathing in through your nose that's a good one for everyone to try later anything else you'd like to add before we move on rich um it's probably just a little bit of the order you do things in when when, when tasting beer because you'll, you'll pour your, your beer, you probably look at it first, but don't spend too long looking at the appearance before you go to the aroma, because that can change quite rapidly uh, as, as you go through the experience of the beer. Um, so try to try get to go into the aroma quite early on. Yeah, very good one. A lot of the volatile compounds will go straight away. There is a handy reminder on the beer score sheet. Uh, which, if you look now, that's in the middle. Aromas at the top of the sheet, it's a handy reminder to look at it first. Yeah. What some people do, they pour the beer, go straight for the aroma, make a few notes, and then start looking at the beer and doing appearance, yeah. which is another good idea, because sometimes you get those initial really volatile aromatics that are gone in seconds. You get your first impressions down, and then you come back to it fresh after looking at the appearance. Once you've been doing it a while, you'll find a system that works for you. Okay. It's also worth, worth looking at it early on because you are looking at how the head has poured. Just check that to start with before you do anything else. 
Yeah, definitely. And I mean, one of the things that we do comment on is the head retention. So if you spend a lot of time looking at the aroma, you might not notice that the head dispersed very quickly and things like that. So just just work out a system that works for you. OK, I'm just going to start going over a typical score sheet with you now and explain what we're looking for in each part what we're judging for and how to fill it in so this will be the sort of what's the word i'm looking for prompts as you're sampling beer i mean we all know how to drink beer most of us are experts at drinking beer but what we're going to do now is think about beer and try and express it in language that can explain to someone else who hasn't drunk the beer what it's like so if we look at the score sheet, first off at the top here, you've got self-explanatory. If you're judging this beer, you need to put your name, your BJCP ID if you've got one, and your judge email. Now, every score sheet I've ever seen sent out has an email address on it for the judge that did it. I will say now, they may not always be legible, much like all the rest of the comments on the sheet. We do try and write tidily uh, as you go through the day and more beers and more beers and more beers, sometimes it does slip. But if you get an illegible sheet or one that's nearly illegible, see if you can decipher the email address and contact the judge that filled it in and ask them to decipher their handwriting for you. Uh, there's the ability to put your BJCP rank or any non-BJCP qualifications you might have. Down this side here, you've got a load of different definitions of potential off flavours and a description of each one to remind you what they are. If you get it in the beer, it should be ticked by here. And if you're not, if you're not into beer judging and you're just here to try sampling beer, Look at some of those descriptors there, because some of them will be in beers that you buy in the shop and you may not have ever realised they were an off flavour. Here in the UK, I can think of at least two major brands that I can go into the supermarket and buy where every single beer they've got is absolutely stinking of diacetyl. So things to look out for there. Down the bottom, just a quick scoring guide of a range that the beer should score in. If it's an absolutely world-class example of the style, 45 to 50, and so on down. 0 to 13. Now, there's a thing that's not really known too much outside of judges and that's that we normally award a courtesy score of 13 points so if you are sitting the exam and you get an absolute dire beer do not score it less than 13 points if you're in a competition Ask the head judge or the organiser if they've got a courtesy score. I've judged with some organisers who say there's no such thing as a courtesy score. We're judging, we're marking beers out of 50 points, not out of 37. So just to bear in mind there. And some tick boxes. Was it a great example? Did it have flaws? Was it just a really wonderful beer or whatever? So that's all self-explanatory. I'll hand you over to Rich if he's happy to talk through the top section over on the right. Yeah, so obviously the section on the right is really the top, the first area there is explaining what beer this is we're judging. And when you get a score sheet that back, it's usually worth checking that your entry number is right. It should be nowadays. Most of this is done by a computerised system when we get them in. But we have had cases where people have been sent the wrong score sheet. Um, and then the category and subcategory from the score sheet, uh, from, the, from the style guide uh, that it was judged under, uh, which will also be written out, uh, and along with any special ingredients, just to make sure that the judges have read your full description because some of the categories like fruit beer uh you are required when you enter a beer to tell us what the fruit is um and actually you should find that there 
there's a section on bottle inspection. So often you'll only find this bit filled in if there's something wrong with the bottle. Uh, like we've got a bottle that's very underfilled um, or the cap appears loose or something. Um, often if the bottle appears fine, you won't find much in this area. Um, and then we go on to the main areas of description. Yeah. You want to go through these, Sarah? Yeah, sure. I'll start us off with aroma then. So. Yep. So aroma. Oh, go on. What? Go on. <laughs> yeah. You, you go first. You go All first. Right. Aroma. So you'll see aroma as appropriate for style. So each of these sections, whenever you whenever you filling it in, bear in mind: is it appropriate for the style? If it's not make sure to say it's not appropriate because it will be checked for by the graders when they grade the exam if you're sitting the exam so we've got a handy little prompt there saying that you need to comment on malt hops esters and other aromatics okay so for each of these think of three things what is it what type of it and how much of it so is it an intense, dark, roasted coffee malt aroma? And if you go through thinking of each of these things like that, doing the what, what type and how much, then assuming, of course, there's some similarity between that and what the proctors have put on their sheets, then you'll be doing good in this section. So, for instance, when we're looking at malt, we're thinking of the aromas that you get off there. Does it smell like coffee? Does it smell like chocolate? Does it smell like bread or toast or bread crumb? These sort of things are what you'd expect to see for malt. Uh, when it comes to hops, what you wouldn't expect to see is just hoppy. Uh, unfortunately, we do see it sometimes. But you need to be a bit more specific than that. You should be thinking what type of hops, not necessarily the variety, but what class. Is it uh, spicy, earthy? Is it tropical fruit? Is it... And anything you can think of, you can put there. And there's actually a flavour wheel you can look at. Uh, it's available in the BJCP app. Practically any... Uh, book on cooking or sensory analysis will feature the flavour wheel and you can look at that to see ideas of the sort of things that should be going in there. Esters are things like fruity aromas that you don't get from the hops. They're normally driven by the yeast and fermentation and any other aromatics you get which depending on if there's anything up with the beer could be uh, spicy notes from phenolics, could be baby vomit from butyric acid. So that's the sort of things to be thinking about when you come to aroma. What, what type and how much of it? Do you want to talk about flavour, Rich? It's much the same really, isn't it? Yeah, it's much the same. There's one thing on appearance. Ah, yeah, oh, appearance, sorry. You can also get uh, colour charts like this. You'll get one of these when you, when you pass, pass every BJCP grade um, that will help you match up the colour you're seeing with the numbers that are in the style guide um, to see if this colour is appropriate. Uh, for, for appearance, you, you're actually doing more than just the colour. You're looking at, obviously, clarity, uh, the, 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 the appropriateness of the beer, yeah, the colour of the beer, the, the colour and form of the head, the describing how bubbly the head is, is, is you can get quite um, lyrical about that sometimes. Um, and then, I mean, if you could have words like, yeah, rocky, meringue, fun, you get, yeah, velvety, that sort of thing. You can get some quite fun words in there. Um, but you're also looking at how long the head lasts, whether it fades rapidly and disappears, or lasts for a long time or just drops down to a nice ring around the outside. Um, the score for appearance is only three. Um, so even the, the murkiest one is not going to lose a huge amount of points here. Um, but it should be appropriate for style. So you could have a hazy beer, but if it's a deeper, that's fine. Um, 
yeah, as you mentioned, it's like out of three points. So if you're supposed to have a brilliantly clear golden coloured beer with a long lasting head and what you've actually got is a stout with no head and no clarity at all, you you should only lose three points. Now, of course, if it also has other problems elsewhere, you'll lose points there as well. But for appearance, that's probably the least important thing to worry about if you're entering a beer into competition, because if that's all that's wrong, you're not going to lose many points. And some of the things that are wrong in appearance are often symptoms of something wider wrong with the beer. Indeed. Uh, we'll come on to those things later. Including picking up the wrong bottle of beer and posting that. Yeah, we usually notice when we've got stouts that's in the wrong cat in this sort of Belgian pale category. This is true. Um, yeah, flavour is more or less the same thing. You've got the prompt there, should be commenting on malt, hops, fermentation characteristics. So any flavours that you're getting from the yeast, like you might be getting um, banana and clove from a Hefeweizen or something like that, which is coming from the yeast, not the malt or the hops. Uh, the balance. Now, balance can be taken two ways. Is it malt heavy, hop heavy? Is it sweet? Is it dry? I tend to comment on both just to cover my bases. Um, the finish aftertaste. Now, when you first start sampling a beer and you take it in your mouth, swirl it around your mouth, you'll get some flavours, but when you swallow it, you start to get what's called the aftertaste, and sometimes you can get something different lingering on the back of your palate. That's the aftertaste and what the beer finish is like. And then anything else that you can taste as other flavour characteristics. Uh, mouthfeel might be a good one to talk about a bit, Richard. Yeah, so there's, what, there's one big one in here, which is carbonation, um, and that impacts the whole of the rest of the beer drinking experience. So when you see carbonation wrong here, you can often have lost points across the rest of the score sheet. Um, you very, once again here, we're looking at low, medium, high, very high for pretty much all of these. Uh, the second, ma second major one in here is the body of the beer. How does it feel in your mouth? Is it watery, thin? which can be appropriate for some styles, or is it a big, chunky Imperial Stout-like? Oh, yeah, I almost, love Imperial Stout. Uh, <laughs> I need to bring Imperial Stout since it's your, it's your call, Sarah. Um, uh, yeah, you need to call out on the body. Uh, after that, you're looking at creaminess, which is a sort of smoothness in the mouth. It's quite a, quite a difficult one to explain. Um, and then on to astringency, which can be quite difficult to separate from some of the other flavours. It's more like the drying if you are sucking on a tea bag sort of expression in your mouth. Don't go and do that. It's really unpleasant. <laughs> um, but if you are desperate to understand what it's like, you do so at your own risk. <laughs> Just don't try to do it before we taste the beer. <laughs> and, yeah, and the final area here... You're really looking at alcohol warmth, the sort of warming sensations you get from stronger beers um, and ones with fermentation flaws in them um, that leave you with longer, with higher alcohols in them can be pulled out here. Um, there are other palate sensations you get here. Basically, it's anything you feel on your palate that isn't part of the flavour is what we've got for here. Yeah. And then overall impression. So start off with, did you like the beer? If you did, Tell the brewer, really great beer, really enjoyed it. Send me the recipe, I want to brew it. And any suggestions for improvement normally belong here. Sometimes if I haven't managed to, or if I find that something's only appropriate to aroma or whatever, I might also comment on it there. Because that comes back to whether it's appropriate for style or not. But this is where basically you should find the meat of your feedback to improve the beer. The rule of thumb, and it is just a rule of thumb, is that for every five points you knock off a beer, there should really be a point for improvement or some suggestion for how to make it more like the style next time. If you can't think of 
something they could have done different to make a better beer, then you probably shouldn't have knocked that extra five points off it. So that is an introduction to the score sheet. Was there anything you wanted to add before we crack open the beer? Yeah, I about that. The last section is always is quite good fun. It is where you're trying to work your way into the brewer's process and work out what you think actually went wrong. It is quite close to guesswork, but in field competitions we've done recently where we've actually had people there straight after we filled in score sheets, we have discovered that we're actually fairly accurate. Uh, not not completely accurate, but we often work get, get to at least close to where something's gone wrong. Yeah, especially with the online ones we've been doing recently where the brewers literally sat there and told us what they've done. And it's like, yeah, that explains it. And And they've been a very good process because we've been able to find out how far off or close we were as well. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, I think that was it. I did think of something else, but it's gone now. So what I'll suggest, let's crack open the beer, get it in a glass and give it a sniff. This, is, If you've already cracked yours open, all power to you. I had something else to drink whilst we were talking. <coughs> If your beer is very cold because it's straight out the fridge, don't pour a full glass, just pour half a glass or whatever so it warms up a bit quicker for now. You can drink the rest of it after. It's always worth leaving a bit of space above the beer in the glass anyway. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so normally what would happen at this point, Rich and me would be sat across the table from each other, we'd start furiously writing away and scribbling. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to talk through the impressions we're getting as if we were doing it. What we'd normally do is either at the end of each section or at the end of the beer, chat about it anyway. So we'll just move that forward and start talking about the aroma. Wait, I'm getting um, some fruity esters. We're talking uh, light citrus, possibly orange. Uh, and definitely fruity aromas. I'm getting them straight off the top. Yeah, I'd, I'd head towards pear as well. Yeah. And some pepper. Yeah, yeah, definitely spiciness there. Yeah. Yeah, pepper. Almost um, a perfume element to it. And there's some sort of underlying sweetness, a sort of light caramel maltiness. Yeah, this is one that I struggle with. I've been told that you can't smell sweet. I swear yeah. I can. <laughs> yeah, I, I go towards, you can smell sugary and that yeah. kind of thing. Sort of, the, it, it's implied the sweet from what the, the, what, what the, the aroma is. You yeah, can definitely exactly. smell sugariness. But yeah, it's definitely got that as well, hasn't it? So, folks in the chat, you're sampling your beers. I want to hear what you're getting from the aroma. Type it in and we'll see what you're getting as well. Because this isn't just about us. This is about you. We want to help you improve your palate, your analysis of beer, your understanding of beer. So I'm seeing... Uh, where Got, I'm seeing a bubble gum in there, which is... Yeah, a bubble yeah. gum yum. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose it pear, is. Yeah. There is that element of that um, pink bubble gum in there. The, yeah. The I, bubble I yeah, It's sort of strawberry flavour. Yeah. I poured mine half an hour ago, and it's and it's really fruity on the nose. Yeah, I totally agree with that one. So, so we've got reminiscent of my cat's basket. That's quite an entertaining <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> What's I wonder what they're trying to say the there. Question. Does their cat's basket <laughs> smell this good or does yeah. the, their beer smell that bad? Yeah. Back with the more, more sensible one. Cloves, yeah, that's a good call out. <laughs> Citrus pear are mainly pissed for, <laughs> <laughs> what is it, a seven point something ABV? Yeah. 8.5 ABV. So, yeah, if, you, if you've if you bought two bottles of this along and you started before you even got here, yeah, I can see mainly pissed. You're going to have a good Friday. Yeah. Yeah, I hope, hope you book tomorrow off. So, yeah, we're seeing 
pears, sherbet. Sherbet's a good one. Yeah. Pears, sherbet, citrus. Uh, some bread from Global Fighter. Uh, David Farron says definitely strong esters and he's right what would you could you elaborate a little and say maybe what those esters are reminding you of that's always a good point to put on there so rather than um, if you were to be filling in the sheet as a judge normally you wouldn't just say um, strong esters you'll try to go back to what what type and how much of it so it's always good to think of a descriptive term for what you're getting uh matt cliff said his glass was too big poured into a smaller one now and this is actually a very good point when we judge in the uk most of the major competitions now i say most use the iso tasting glasses the wine ones uh, when I first started, we used plastic tumblers. Uh, and if you were lucky, they got the hard ones and not the soft ones that stunk of plastic. Uh, but yet, if you use a really big glass or a shaker or nonic pint glass, you'll still get a lot of the character of the beer. But if you've got something that curls in a bit that helps hold it in a bit more, you will find that you get more out of the aroma if you're looking for it. If you're just drinking beer, and I, I've had that question in the past, has, has learning more about beer made you hate drinking beer? And the answer is no. It's quite happily neck back stuff without really tasting it. There's nothing better on a cold day than knocking back something cold and fizzy. But yeah, thinking about what you're drinking is always good. Definitely get pears, bready, some spice and a sense of sweet malt. I like that, I like that a lot. Nice points, David. Like cheap champagne, says Jay. We've got a couple of people calling out banana, which yeah. is yeah, I, I could probably go with that. It's usually, uh, I probably go with a different ester on this, but I, I can understand banana. Yeah, I can as well. I'm definitely getting more pears as the beer warms up some more as well. Okay, so what we should be getting, if I just switch over to this, what we should be getting on the aroma is complex with significant fruity esters, a moderate spiciness, and low to moderate alcohol and hop aromas. The esters are reminiscent of lighter fruits, such as pear, oranges, and apples. A moderate to moderately low spicy peppery phenols. I'm only reading it out because some people will be looking at this on small screens and not be able to read it themselves. A low to moderate yet distinctive perfumey floral hop character is often present. Alcohols are soft, soft, spicy, perfumey and low to moderate in intensity. No hot alcohol or solventy aromas. And the malt character is light and slightly grainy sweet to nearly neutral. So let's let's have a vote now in the in the chat. I want you to turn around and give me a score for the aroma of this beer based on how well it matches that description in the style guide. So out of 12 points, if this ticks all those boxes, the beer should get a 12 for aroma. If you think it's not bad, not bad, and gets most of them, nine. Halfway there, six. So let's see what people think this beer should be getting for the aroma. See, interesting, someone in the chat mentioned the foam banana sweets. Yeah. The chemical that's used to, to make foam banana sweets banana flavoured is the same one as you get in things like Hefeweizen's and the banana flavour you get in beers. So that's a, that's a good call out there. Yeah, definitely. I'm getting a, a little bit of lag in the chat because I'm doing the casting, so it's coming back to me late. So we're starting to see scores coming in now. We're seeing things like uh, nines, eights, 
So nine from Sarah Morgan. Um, Richard Swindells gives it an eight. Tom Dolly an eleven. David McCarthy a ten. So they're all all these scores I'm seeing are up the top end, and I think yeah, definitely. I think this is probably I'll probably be looking at an eleven for this myself. Yeah, I'll be in that region. I can't find anything much here that shouldn't be there. No, and that's that's always one of the things you're looking for. Is there anything? in the beer that shouldn't be there. The other thing you're looking for is there anything that should be there that isn't there. Yeah. Um, it ticks nearly all of those. Uh, let's see. Esther's Reminiscent of Pears. Yes, we've had everyone call that out. Um, hang on. I've managed to scroll down to flavour. Uh, so Esther's, yeah, Pears, moderate to moderately low spicy I mean, that's the only thing I would say. I'd say it's we're certainly more than moderately low spicy peppery yeah. phenols. Uh, but yeah, it's there's nothing there that I'd really knock it down for aroma. I wouldn't be able to give it a point for improvement to say, do this to make it smell better like it should. Okay, next on down on the score sheet is appearance. Do you want to talk us through the appearance, Rich? Well, obviously the first thing to do is try to hold up some light. I don't have a... I think you guys have my available light over there. Um, so what we've got here is a sort of pale, light yellow, pretty much clear. Uh, with, and it started off with a very tall white head of sort of rocky of medium-sized bubbles that's faded down to a fairly large, fairly thick uh, remaining film there, which is nice. Um, there's a bit of, the, of lacing on the glass. You can see there's some, there's some lacing remaining on the glass, which is which is interesting. Um, and that really covers what you're able to be mostly talking about in appearance. Yeah, indeed. Um, well, some stronger it, beers, you'll get some visible legs if you swirl the glass. Mm -hmm. If you get those, that's also should also be noted in appearance. For folks that are intending to sit the exam, with each of these sections, it is expected that you will use all the available space. To the point that for each line you don't fill in, you will lose half a point. Um, I think uh, that only applied to the longer ones, appearance, you were expected to use all three lines. So just be aware that you should be doing a good description in each of the sections, not just big letters. Um, although writing bigger can help if you've been judging a lot of beer in the day, because it can help make it easier to read. So appearance, back to the style guide which is a guiding light when it comes to judging beers against it. It should be yellow to medium gold in colour, good clarity, effervescent, massive, long-lasting, rocky, often beady white head, resulting in characteristic Belgian lace on the glass as it fades. And this comes back to what Richard was saying. You can use some quite beautiful and descriptive prose when talking about the foam in a glass of beer. So what do people think about the appearance? Remember, you've only got three points you can award for appearance. Is there much they could do to improve it? If there's not, then it should generally be three. It's very rare I'll ever give less than three for appearance. Um, if it's not the right clarity, I might knock one off. If it's got no head retention, I might knock one off. Yeah, you, you might get down to one if it has no head, looks like soup and a slightly weird colour. Yeah. Um, and like you mentioned earlier, if you get that, then it's odds on it's going to lose out a lot on aroma and flavour as well, because it's normally something fairly sad with the yeast or the beer itself. All right, so let's 
pop over to chat, see what people are saying about that. One thing to think about if the head of something like this doesn't last uh, is how clean your glass is. Um, we do take quite a bit of effort to clean out glasses in competition so that that doesn't become a problem. But yeah, if, if there is any any anything really on the inside of your glass, it can just knock the head retention out. Very true, very true. Um, so we got a comment from Eugene saying, I wouldn't say good clarity for the one I've got. Um, which is possible. I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong by any means. I didn't think it was um, bottle fermented. But it's, it, they are bottle conditions. Yeah, they usually. are. So, yeah, it could be that the beer was disturbed, kicking up sediment, which would explain the clarity, perhaps. Um, generally, when it comes to commercial beers like this, they are... Uh, of a good enough quality control that it's unlikely to be a bad bottle. But yeah, as they are uh, bottle conditioned, there's yeast sediment on the bottom that can be stirred up quite easily. So that might be uh, hitting the clarity there. Yep, Steve, it, you are right. It is bottle conditioned. I forgot about that. Um, so yeah. Nearly everyone's coming in with three points. Um, I like that from Herman Brewing. Three, lovely lacing and superb head retention. Yeah, can't fault it. I'll give it three. Rich, three? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely agree on that one. Cool. So, on to flavour. Back to the style guide. What are we looking for or expecting for flavour? So it's a marriage of fruity, spicy and alcohol flavours supported by a soft malt character. The esters are reminiscent of pears, oranges or apples. Low to moderately low fennels as peppery in character. A low to moderate spicy hop character is often present. And I'll just highlight that there. Note how it's made the distinction between a spicy hop character and spicy peppery fennels because they come from two different sources. The alcohols are soft and spicy and are low to moderate in intensity. Bitterness is typically medium to high from a combination of hot bitterness and yeast produced phenolics. Substantial carbonation and bitterness leads to a dry finish with a low to moderately bitter aftertaste. So for anyone wanting to sit the exams, if you look at that flavour description there, and I will say point blank now, not all of them are that good, but that one does hit nearly all the things that it says to comment on in the score sheet. You won't find that in every description in the style guide, but this one is a very good example of what you should be putting in. All right, now flavour is the biggest one on there. You've got 20 points to award this beer for flavour. What do you think? Do you think it ticks those boxes? I'm definitely getting fruity, spicy. The alcohol's definitely there. I'm getting pear esters. Rich, is there anything there you think shouldn't be that is in the beer? Or anything that should that isn't. I'm not getting any flavours that shouldn't be there, but I can definitely pull out things like there's oranges mentioned there, um, yeah, spicy alcohol. Uh, there's a little low sort of spicy hop flavour in there. Um, and this is just sticking it mostly to the beginning of the flavour. We also get, yeah, the phenols from the yeast, so sort of slightly clove and back to pepper again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, is anyone noticing any difference in the aftertaste? I'm finding there's a bit more spice in the aftertaste for me. So, you get some up front, but as you actually swallow it and your palate starts to ease off, I'm starting to get a bit more spice there. So, let's have a look at the comments. We've got... 
Um, Matt seems to struggle with the spicy and peppery characters in beers. They can be heard to um, distinguish when you first start doing it. As you drink more beers, you'll start to get more used to what's yeast derived, what what's coming from hops, and where the, each of these flavors are coming from, and be able to actually detect the difference between them. It does take practice. Yeah, I think the practice is, is attaching words to what you're sensing. That's often the hard bit. You know you're sensing something, and it, it may be familiar, but trying to recall what that is can be really hard. Yep, definitely. And it does come back to trying a lot of things. Uh, I was at a Women's International Beer Summit recently, and it just so happened that after I had announced I was doing this, I found out one of the talks there was someone doing an introduction to beer judging and one of the things that was suggested by them is keep a notebook with you when you're trying beers it doesn't have to be a physical one it can be heck it can be untapped for all that it matters and just make a few notes each time of what you're getting from the beer and then maybe in a year come back try it again and see how your descriptions have changed but in the meantime try different things if you go somewhere i mean we've all been locked up for however long life's starting to get back to normal if you start going back to buffets start trying different things that you might not have normally tried before and discover these different flavors because in the style guide you'll find things described as lychee passion fruit but if you've never tried them you've got nothing to equate them to no mental picture so anytime you get the chance to try something new especially if it's not going to cost you more to do it then do it give it a go and then you can build up those flavor memories and sense memories and that's all we're doing when it comes to filling in the score sheet when we're judging beer we're creating word pictures now the main difference between beer judges and other people isn't that we are better at tasting things we are better at describing what we're tasting we may have then built up some experience where we can decipher between two similar things and describe what we're getting and that's the practice i suggest try different things all right back to the chat let's just see where we are i mean love it 20 points so yeah people are feeling it scoring high on flavor uh, there's a couple of comments there that are quite nice there's a, there's a couple of people called out honey which is a, another good good descriptor for this kind of beer. Yep, definitely. Uh, Herman Brewing again. The yeast steals the show here and hops just adding to that dominant backbone. Yep, there's one for honey there from Tom Dolly. Honey aftertaste. Orange overtaking the pear, which was more at the forefront before. Spiciness is very nice, but more than the guidelines, question mark. Yeah, perhaps a little a little high in the beer. I'll be looking at around 17 out of 20 personally. I think it pushes the spiciness a little too far for my personal interpretation of the guidelines. But overall, very good beer. True to the style. Just maybe not so much for me. What was your thoughts, Rich, on flavour? Yeah, I, that's the only area I'd have called out. Is, is the spice in this is quite high. Uh, I'd probably go about 18 on this. Um, because it is, it's, it's, a, it's a minor difference from, from the target. Um, so, so you could really only give some very, very general advice on changing it. True, true. James said something uh, there that was relevant to something you've done recently, uh, tasting different things. You did one on coffee recently, didn't you? Yeah, James was in that session as well. So, um, <laughs> um, yeah, there was a there was a, an online coffee tasting session, the, the largest coffee tasting online in the world, or something, which was quite fun, run by a coffee YouTuber. Was that James? 
James, what's his James name? Sanford was... Oh, no. Uh, I, he's also there's, from Manchester. Um, there's James, who was the barista of the year or something some years back uh, that I think the YouTube were on coffee as well. I can't he, remember. He's got really good hair. I can't remember his name. Um. Right. <laughs> it could be. It could be them. Yeah. Um, David McCarthy, 17 out of 20. Yeah. I, I think we're all more or less in the same sort of ballpark on that. So, mouthfeel. Well, moving on quickly, we've got about 10 minutes left. I knew this first one was going to go quickly because we had a lot of introductions to do that we won't need to do for future weeks. And I'm just going to... The, the coffee guy's name is James Hoffman. The Hoffman, that's it, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just going to put a ticker along the bottom which shows you what beers we're going to be doing in the next few weeks. So if you want to go out and get them, then feel free to do that and then you'll be ready for the next shows as well. But yeah, this one, moving on quickly, body carbonation. I'd probably go medium light on the body with very high carbonation. Yep. Definitely. Um, Style Guide says very highly carbonated, effervescent. Uh, yeah, I'd say it's definitely hit that spot. Uh, light to medium body, again, as Rich just said, yeah, it's definitely in that ballpark. Uh, it's lighter than the substantial gravity would suggest, and I'd, I'd say yes, an 8.5% you'd normally expect to be a bit more robust in the mouth and a bit more um, heavy. A smooth but noticeable alcohol warmth. No hot alcohol or solventy character. I'd say that's definitely worth calling out the solventy character. We do tend to see that quite a bit in competition where we're judging a beer and the temperature's just got away a bit with the fermentation and you can get the yeast when it gets hot, it gets unhappy, unhealthy, starts kicking off all sorts of um, off flavours, but you can get higher alcohols, fusels, solvents, and it can get quite unpleasant at times. So it's always one to look out for at homebrew events is when you get to mouthfeel, is it hot? Is it burning? Is it like drinking some sort of lacquer or white spirits or something like that? This is also a section where I positively call out beers not having things. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you'd be saying no astringency, no no hot alcohol, um, because well, it's a good thing not to have it. Um, and there's a, there's quite a lot to get through in this section. Definitely. Um, overall, though, if folks want to start typing into chat their thoughts on the mouthfeel, what sort of scores they'll give it, you've got five points to award in this section. So this is not the highest scoring section, but it's enough to push a beer down a level on the scale. So I'll just <laughs> turn the ticker back off so we can... See some of the chat comments that are coming in. <laughs> One from Justin. It's like angels peeing on my tongue. I think Dan makes a point I was probably going to make on this. Um, there's a reason to drink loads of Duval as a home brewer. The labels come off really easily and they're really strong bottles. Yeah, definitely. I haven't had that comment come up yet, so I can't highlight. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Nice bottle for home brewers. Yeah, we do send. We do tend to see quite a few of these bottles come in at competition. Um, this and when you see Trappist bottles come in, you, you tend to think, "Here's someone who knows a little bit about beer. Let's hope they've done a good beer." Uh, highly carbonated with a light carbonic bite that tingles on the tongue. Moderate body, well attenuated, and a drying finish from Richard Swindles. Good points, good points. Um, for people who are not aware, a light carbonic bite, if something's very highly carbonated, you can get um, a little bit of carbonic acid there and that can come across as a little bit of bite on your tongue. So that's carbonic acid or 
carbonic bite and yeah when a beer or a wine or champagne is highly effervescent you will get a lovely tingle on the tongue and it's always worth calling that out if you get it uh, letterboxes for a bit of hot alcohol and solvent is anyone else is getting solvent please let us know in the chat uh, five on mouthfeel to style nothing wrong so yeah we're looking about uh, four or five from everyone here uh, Rich what do you think oh uh, yeah this is a five for me there's one but someone's commented in the chat whether we can mark half marks no we only mark in round round numbers it just makes it too complicated if we go anything else people will be in thirds and irrational numbers fast enough knowing us lot I yeah I mean I have seen when judges were in disagreement they just literally split the, yeah. split the difference or, and the steward put half mark in for the consensus score but generally no it would be full marks only yeah uh, not big enough. A 500 mil would be better. Uh, that would definitely lead to a good Friday. Um, mine is two years old, a bit of solvent. So you weren't the only person getting solvent then. Um, Matt Cliff says the end of the bottle is now hazy. Why is that? Um, as a few people pointed out earlier, Duval is bottle conditioned. So in the very bottom of the bottle, there's a tiny layer of yeast sediment. So by the time you might have poured a few samples out of the bottom, it could have disturbed that back into the beer and it will be a little bit yeasty. You'll see it quite a bit with some homebrew that's bottle conditioned. You get that little layer of sediment at the bottom you don't get it with too many commercial beers because most commercial beers they make sure that that's gone before it goes in the bottle uh anything else before we go on to overall impression we're going to go slightly over the hour um if anyone needs to hop off i totally understand but we'll try and wrap it up in the next five minutes i think we should move on i think yeah, OK, so overall drinking pleasure associated with the entry and give suggestions for improvement. Well, I'm going to cut straight in and say I've got no suggestions to improve this beer. As far as I'm concerned, it is significantly to style. It's outstanding. It's an, an outstanding example of the style, 45 to 50 for me. And I really enjoy drinking it so much. So that was why I picked it for the first one of these events. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the definitive example of this style. So you'd expect it to be up there somewhere in the high scores. Um, I mean, compared to the description, it is pretty dry on the finish. Um, if you're going to go anywhere with it, that's probably where we go or some of the Small put the little point other people have called out. Uh, what um, was that? Da, da, da. So we've had, yeah, so some of these things that, that if people were scoring this themselves, uh, they'd want to be calling out, if someone had called out solvent, you probably want to be talking about yeast health and fermentation temperatures and things like that. Yeah. Um, and so forth. Uh, does anyone know if they use a different strain for their bottle conditioning if it's not worth harvesting, asked David Farron. Uh, I it's don't, the same one? I don't know if they use a different strain. Um, I don't think so in this no, I case. Think it, I think it's the same expert. one. I, I'm not certain, but I think it's the same one. Yeah, that was my thoughts, but I haven't done any research into this particular one. Some breweries do put in a different yeast into the bottle for conditioning. Um, I don't think this is one of them, though. Uh, Great Beer says Special K's channel. I totally agree. It is the classic example of the style. Uh, it's basically the style that defined, uh, the beer that defined the style. If this wasn't a world-class example of the style, then we've done a very bad job of writing the style guide. Um, but the other thing to bear in mind when I say that, th a lot of these styles, not all of them now, it is getting better, but a lot of these styles are written 
by Americans in America, sampling a beer that may have taken months to cross the pond and get to them. So you'll see some styles where there's a discrepancy between what's described in the style guide and what a good, fresh, local example of that beer is like. Simply because they were originally written after a transatlantic journey of the beer, and not all beers travel as well as others. It's getting a lot better, though. A lot of the styles are being rewritten by locals to where the beer has come from. Um, so the 2015 ones are better than the previous 2008 ones were by a long way. And some of the really new ones, um, there's some South American and New Zealand styles in there that are being written by locals. Yeah, that's what I like about, especially the newer styles. Uh, they are pulling them in now. We are hopefully going to be doing some changes soon that I think are just tweaks. I don't think there's a major rewrite in process at the moment, but there are definitely some tweaks coming soon. Uh, whether that will just be done as updates to the existing one or whether it will get a new year number, because we're currently on 2015 styles. So overall, that was Duval. I hope you've enjoyed being with us today. I'm going to cut it I know it's a bit short, but we've over the hour now. I really appreciate Rich taking his time out of his day to be with us today. I've invited him back. We'll see if he's um, had enough of chatting with us all, <laughs> if he's back next week or not. I'm always willing to drink beer. Cool. Well, in that case, we'll see you back next week, Rich. <laughs> next week, we are doing Jaipur from Thornbridge. It's not Jaipur X. If you can get that anywhere, I'm jealous. I love that beer, uh, but it's quite seasonal. So this is... I've been the... getting in practice. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. If you hold it up again, Rich, you were... the camera's slightly off camera. That's the one we're doing. It's the Jaipur from Thornbridge, the orange one in a can. So that's what we're doing next week. Following on from that, it will be the Erding of Weissbier, Guinness Original, if you can get it, which is the one in a bottle, not the can with the widget in. Thixton's Old Peculiar and the classic Nuki Brown. So if you can make it, Along next week, we're going to be trying a different beer, which has got some quite different characteristics over this one. And hopefully we'll be able to get you to build some new sensory memories and some new word pictures in your brain to help describe that beer in future. Thanks ever so much for joining us today. I hope you found it useful. I've had a blast and I hope we're going to see you again next time. <laughs>